So hello, everybody. It's so great to see so many faces uh, here. Uh, I should probably take even more pictures, uh, because otherwise my mom is not going to believe me. But anyways, um, my name is Mike. I build distributed systems for fun and living. Uh, but I'm also a Java developer. And that's why today I would like to talk about the unknown or less known parts of the GUnit 5 library. Uh, well, you may ask, unknown, how is it possible? Uh, JUnit is like almost everywhere in almost every Java project out there. And in fact, uh, version 5 has been released like five years ago, quite a lot of time ago. So what's the problem? Is there something wrong with project documentation? Well, in order to answer that, I took a look at the official JUnit 5 user guide. And you know what? It's awesome. It's great stuff. It's full of really practical advices. You should really try it on your own as well. So probably, if we would all read these fantastic manuals for the tools that we are using, uh, the world would be a better place. Our code would be the better place. But for some reasons, it's not always the case. But maybe that's good, because I have a reason to be here with you today. So what's the plan for this uh, session? First, I would like to focus on practical stuff, so things that you could uh, apply in your everyday work, starting from some interesting ways of parameterizing tests, including writing data table tests, similarly to what you may know from Spark. Uh, then we'll scratch the surface of customizing test case names. Uh, then I will show you how you could avoid uh, duplication within your test code, but without using inheritance. And last but not least, I will uh, present you my proposal for pragmatic test parallelization. Uh, but I have, you have to warn you first. Uh, we have a lot of uh, things to cover and uh, not that much time. Uh, so the pace may be quite high. Uh, but don't worry, at the very end, I will leave you with all the resources and code samples that I will be showing today. So all right, let's go. Time for our first topic. So those interesting ways of parameterizing your test. And luckily, for that purpose, I have an example just for you. Imagine a very simple pricing engine that is expected to calculate a price of a certain item, where the price is actually just a named amount of money, nothing fancy. Yet, um, we need some business logic, right? So every such a calculator will probably simply subtract um, some kind of marketing discount, uh, sorry, discount that is associated with marketing campaign from a regular price. Uh, but there is more than that. So we have an additional business rule here saying that we cannot go below zero or we cannot have free items. Uh, instead, we have to fall back to some minimal but still taxation meaningful value maybe for taxation purposes, whatever. It's our business logic. So with such an implementation in place, we probably should think about uh, testing it. So one way of doing so could look more or less like that. I have three very simple test cases here. So first one is the happy path, when we are just applying a discount to the regular price. The second one is when we are falling back to this minimal price when the discount is full, which means that the discount is the same as the full price. And the last one is, again, falling back to this minimal price when the discount is actually greater than the regular price. Uh, and it's nothing wrong with these test cases, because as you can see, they work. Um, this is the code that we are like, used to, uh, to write every day. But there is one thing that I don't like here. It is a structural duplication. What does it mean? We have three different test cases, but in fact, each one of them looks exactly the same. So first, we are setting up the regular price. Then we are just uh, creating a discount and associated campaign. Uh, later, we are just putting them all together into our calculator and then verifying whether we get what we wanted three times. So could we somehow avoid this structural duplication? And the answer is yes, of course, because GUnit 5 comes with a tool just for that purpose, which is called parameterized test. One way of writing such parameterized tests would be to use something called a method source. So we have a single test method, and we are using another method, in this case, test cases, uh, to provide us the required parameters. So in this case, our method is a static method returning special JUnit 5 type called arguments. 
that wraps values for each of the use cases. So if we'll run this test right now, you'll see that, in fact, I've run three tests. So we have less structural duplication than before, so kind of success. But if we'll run the test again, you will see that those test case names that we have presented here are not that descriptive. It could be better. But there is one more thing. It's boring. We write such a code like all the time. And what's even worse, it was more or less possible with JUnit 4. So it's definitely not something that you came here for today. Uh, so let me show you something else, probably something more interesting than that. So one thing that you may not be aware of is that you can get rid of the arguments type and use your own. Uh, and what's the, better, um, what's the better option for defining our own type than using greatest and latest Java records? So I have such a record in place. It's called pricing test case. And it accepts all the required parameters. So now with just minimal uh, changes to the test case itself, you see, still everything works, but we have some additional benefits. So first of all, arguments type does not provide us with any type safety. But second of all, just take a look here. Uh, the name of the test case, it's a little bit better, because it relies right now on the startup to string implementation. But we could do better than this. Apart from, yep. Apart from the um, uh, arguments type, JUnit 5 comes with a something called named. And this named type is kind of a wrapper over anything. So we could put some object inside, like our uh, uh, record defining the test case, and associate a name, a business descriptive name, with such a thing. So we could create such a wrapper using a static factory method. In this case, it's called off or named. Those are the same. Why do we need both? Well, um, if you are not into static imports, this is the way to go. If you like static imports, then named just works better. Uh, all right, let's run the test and see the execution output. So as you can see, right now, our execution output contains those names, these names that we just put here. So it's a very simple way of improving uh, how the test output uh, looks like. But we could do even better, uh, because this code feels still quite verbose, at least to me. So let me show you something completely different, CSV source. CSV source is yet another way of parameterizing tests with JUnit 5. And it allows us to define our inputs and outputs as a comma-separated values. Like here. So I have an array, and within this array, every item represents a line with values separated by a comma. If I will run the test again, you will see it works. We have exactly two test cases. Uh, we didn't um, need any additional method to write. So the implementation is quite concise. The readability is not that bad, but we'll, uh, we'll discuss it even more um, in the upcoming minutes. But the test case names, just take a look here. It's not descriptive at all. Like, we should do better. So there's, it's a time to, for me to show you three readability improvements and one magic trick that you could apply here. Let's start from those small improvements. First, JN5 allows you to change the default delimiter that we are using. So instead of boring comma, we could use something like this fancy pipe character, a lot better. Then if we are not using some ancient Java version, we could use a single text block, Java text block, to define all the lines one by one. And what is even more useful, we can apply white spaces here and there just to properly format our, uh, our test input which improves the readability quite a lot. Uh, and as you can see, the test still runs, so nice things. But I promised you a magic trick. Where is the magic trick? Let's go back to the previous example. So in a previous example, all our arguments were of type string. And we were the ones to convert them into amounts using a static method accepting a single string argument. Why is it, is it important here? Yes, it is. Because if we have such a method in, uh, in place, JUnit is smart enough 
to convert these arguments into the target type for us. So I just get rid of code, and things are still working. How cool is that? But we could do better, especially because we still lack the information about the parameter names. So it's hard to say what this is. What, it what does it represent? So what we could do here? Well, the nice thing about the CSV source is that it allows us to define a special header row starting from a hash character um, and then put some labels on it. Cool. But I've also added yet another column that at this point does absolutely nothing with a description just to you know, uh, know what we are supposed to do in this case. But wouldn't it be nice to make this description visible in the test execution? Of course it would be, but how to do it? So if we are about to play with um, the names of the test cases, this is the time to introduce yet another annotation called display name. And display name for singleton, let's call them, singleton test cases like that, um, enable us to override the default test case name. So instead of a name which will be the same as the method name, I could have this nice business descriptive name. But it's not that simple for parameterized test because we have multiple different test cases inside. So what we could do? Well, we still can use the display name annotation, but what we will provide here will behave as a prefix to, for all the test cases inside. But what we need is actually to have something that will be specific for each test case, how to do it. Well. Parameterized test comes with a name parameter, which supports a very simple templating engine. In this case, I've created a template saying, please uh, use the index of a test case, so a number from, uh, starting from zero, and the value of the first, third parameter, which is, surprise, surprise, the description itself. If we'll run the test again, you will see that this name is now part of our test case execution output, which is great. The only drawback here is that I still need to declare description as an argument, because this is a requirement, even if it's not used. OK, time for something a bit different. Imagine another use case. We are about to create a so-called duration encoder. So we have duration in seconds, and we are about to convert these values into ISO-compatible string, like this. So of course, for a test case, uh, let's use something that we just learned, so the CSV source. Uh, and it might look more or less the same as before at first, but there are some differences here. First, our header row does no longer start from a hash. How is it possible? How does it work? Well, it's all thanks to this parameter, use headers in display name. Use headers in display name uh, allows us to get rid of the uh, hash at the beginning, but also See here, it appends the label of the column into the test execution output. So it's a very simple way of improving uh, the readability here. But I believe we can do more, especially with the code when we are mapping one value to another or encoding something. So how we could emphasize that fact? JUnit 5 allows us to not only use a single character as a delimiter, but even a full string. So I could use this fancy do-it-yourself arrow instead of uh, a pipe character. So it makes it clear that we are mapping one value to another. But why not to go even further? Nobody will say that I can't do something like that. I could define my delimiter as this string, seconds encoded as. Just take a look at this beauty. How does it, work? How does it look like? It feels like a specification. It's no longer like a raw input for a test case. The only thing here is that because I want to make this delimiter a part of the test execution output, I have to repeat it here in the uh, name parameter of the parameterized test. But it's a relatively small price for something uh, that looks that nice. OK, back to the slides. So first of all, um, JUnit 5 
has a lot more to offer in terms of test parameterization than just a method source, especially the CSV source. This one is interesting, and this one is really, really powerful. Um, even if it's not so CSV after all, if we'll think for it, about it for a while, well, the naming could be, probably be improved. But the point is that GUnit 5 loves parameterization. It has been built around the parameterization, but we just have to be creative about how we use these tools in our test code. And there's more. So we don't have time to cover things like uh, dynamic test cases here or um, parameterizing your test with enums. But if you are interested, and I hope you are, just read the user guide. It's a great piece of documentation. All right, time for the next topic, so avoiding inheritance in your test code. And again, I have prepared an example. So imagine a remote API, REST API, very simple one, uh, that has only one endpoint called foo that returns some kind of a string. Of course, in order to integrate our application with such a thing, we have to create an HTTP client. Uh, and luckily, I have one in place uh, using, by the way, uh, the built-in Java HTTP client. So no external libraries in, um, included here. Now, with such implementation, we should probably test it somehow, right? The question is how to do it. There are various different ways of doing so. Uh, but I would like to show you one specific that uses a tool called Wiremark. And with Wiremark, we are setting up a fake server, and we could instruct it how we would like it to respond to certain, uh, certain requests. So going through this test case, we are first creating the client, but instead of real URL, I'm providing it with uh, the URL of the Wiremark server. And then I'm instructing the Wiremark, saying, dear Wiremark, Whenever somebody calls slash foo, please respond with a string called bar. Then the rest is relatively straightforward. We are just calling the get foo on the client and verifying whether uh, the value returned from it is the same as we expected. So simple. Let's run the test. All is green. Cool. So what's the problem? Let's scroll a little bit up. You will see that there is quite a lot of boilerplate code included here. So we have to create Wiremark server instance. Then, before all our test cases, we have to start the server. Uh, then, before each test case, we have to reset it, which means saying, dear Wiremark, forget everything that I've said to you before. And last but not least, we have to stop the server once it's no longer used. Uh, and this is not a big deal here, but in a real life application, you will have more tests using such tool in place. And every single test will have this part of code. So it feels right to just move it somewhere else to avoid this duplication. But how to do it? Well, one approach for that, and something that I truly believe you've seen in the past, would be to introduce a base test class like this, base wire mock test. So the test is more or less as it was before. But the difference is here. Now I have an abstract class that every single uh, wired mock uh, test has to extend, which doesn't look bad at first. But there is a slight issue here. And it's behind the extends keyword. We are limited to, an, uh, to extend only one class, one base class at a time. Is that a problem? Yeah, it is a problem, because in real life applications, you will have uh, different uh, things in place, like database or message broker. So you will quickly end up with base test class like base wire mock and the database test, base wire mock and message broker test, and so on and so on. It's a huge mess. You don't want to have it. So what we could do to improve the situation, what we could do, could do to get rid of the uh, inheritance here. Well, let's stick to this base class and see how, how we need to change it in order to achieve that. So first, I got rid of the abstract keyword here and make this class implementing three interfaces coming from JUnit 5. 
before all callback, before each callback, and after all callback. And these interfaces have only single method, each, each one of them, that maps to the same lifecycle stage of the test case than we had before with annotations. So before all is the same as uh, methods annotated with at before all, then before each again, and after all. So relatively small changes to our, uh, our test class. But now we know that inheritance is not the good thing to have. So how to apply this behavior in our test case? Well, since we are talking about GUnit 5, it probably requires us to use yeah, yet another annotation. In this case, it's called extend with. And yeah, if you think that we just created a GUnit 5 extension, you're right. It's a very simple one, but this is how in GUnit 5 we can create our own extensions. The nice thing about uh, using the extend with is that we can have as many annotations like this as we want. There's nothing preventing us from using multiple extensions at a time. Uh, and the test still runs, which is great. But there is one thing that I don't like here. I have to locate the Wiremock server instance in order to get the URL. And right now, I'm using a static method to do that, which is a bit weird, because on one hand, we are just applying an annotation and saying that this test does not have to know about how this extension works. But at the same time, we have to provide this, uh, uh, this method. Could we do better? What if I tell you that we could use something like a dependency injection here? So instead of calling the extension itself, we could make it injecting this value that we re require here for us. And you might think, well, it probably uses Spring under the hood or something. No, 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 no. In fact, this is a pure JUnit 5 implementation. The only change here is a new interface that we are implementing here, which is called Parameter Resolver. Uh, and this Parameter Resolver comes with two different methods, Supports Parameter and Resolve Parameter. The first one is a basic filter that checks whether a certain parameter type is supported, so if we are able to inject it. And if that's the case, then resolve parameter will return a proper value for us. That's simple. Going back to our test, or maybe to our extension, what is even more interesting is that if I will type something like wire mock extension, we'll see an official wire mock JUnit 5 extension. This is a part of the wire mock. Just take a look here. It's more or less the same as we just implemented. Of course, there is a bit more code here, but you understand my point, right? So it's quite easy to make it running. All right, but time for something a little bit different. Imagine we are about to build an online game. This sounds nice, right? And for such a game, we would need at least two objects, some kind of map representation, and of course, a representation of a player. Now, those two objects have something in common. They both implement the comparable interface. Why? Because for players, you may want to compare them by their experience to um, then sort it and have some kind of a rank. And for game maps, we would like to, again, sort them based on their difficulty. So what's the problem here? Well, as you all know, if we have a compare to method, there is a certain contract that we have to obey. There are rules saying when we should return a negative value, positive value, or a zero. So it would be nice to test it, right? And ideally, we should test, write such test only once and use it for both classes. How to do it? Well, the first approach is pretty obvious. Let's use a base class. So we could have something called base comparable test, and define the three test cases here. So one for returning zero, uh, when we are comparing equal values, then another returning positive value when we are comparing uh, to a smaller one, and the last one when we are returning the negative value. So in order to make it work, we have to somehow get the instances of the objects that we are checking. So this is the reason why I have yet another um, type here, which is called comparable test case. And we are requiring 
to provide a list of three values, the smallest one, the middle one, and the greatest one, in order to perform the proper, uh, the proper checks. So the test itself is relatively simple. We are just creating this uh, test data. And if I will run this test, you will see that, in fact, I have all three test cases in place, which is nice. Nice, but we, again, are extending some class. It might not be a huge deal here, but in general, could we do better or could we do differently? So another way of doing so would be to use an interface, because JUnit 5 allows us to define test methods within an interface. So I have an interface called comparable contract, which is more or less the same or very similar to what we had before with a base class. And as you can see, we now have the test cases defined as a default method, because this is the way of defining a body uh, to a method within an interface. So now our test just has to implement such an interface. And that's it. So in theory, we could apply multiple such uh, interfaces on top of a, a single test class. But it might feel, for some of you, like not the best approach to the problem. Are there no other alternatives? Well, luckily, there are plenty of uh, things we could do here. But there is one that I would like to, uh, to show, which is or feels surprisingly simple. Let's define a single test case with three methods, where all of them will be parameterized tests, parameterized with the same method. So the difference here would be that instead of like, providing test cases for a certain type, we are providing very general test cases and parameterizing the class under test itself. So if I will run this test right now, you will see that for every point of the contract, we will run two tests. And of course, thanks to the named type, I could uh, make the test execution output quite readable. So it looks pretty cool. So what I wanted to, uh, to, sh to show you. First, the extensions are really, really simple, uh, which means that there is almost no need to use base test classes anymore. Um, as for those tests as an interface, well, I would be rather careful with that. Uh, things could go wrong. Um, so, but just know that there is such a tool in place. But what about parameterizing tested class? Let me share you a secret. There is no JUnit 5 police that will make you harm because of that. It might be a colleague of yours that will handle this thing. But in general, sometimes it's a very simple solution to the problem. So it's, it might be worth uh, considering. But again, there is more. You could achieve more or less the same thing with um, dynamic test cases, for example. Uh, and there are a lot of different things, other things about writing extensions that we could show here, but we don't have that much time. So if you feel that this is interesting, and I hope you are, just read the user guide. It's great. Last but not least, our last topic, so the pragmatic way of parallelizing our tests. Well, when talking about parallelizing tests, um, the discussion often starts from somebody saying, well, let's parallelize them all. What could possibly go wrong? But it's often easier said than done, especially in the projects that are already for some time here, and we have a lot of test code inside, which means probably a lot of projects out there. Um, and turning the existing test code into something that could be easily run in parallel is not that simple. So does it mean that we have to parallelize them all or not parallelize at all? Is it all or nothing approach? Luckily not, thanks to still experimental API of the GUnit 5. The main part of this API is an annotation called execution. And with execution annotation, we could change the way the JUnit runs our tests. So by default, every node in our test, uh, testing hierarchy will be run one by one using the same threat, uh, threat as, as the parent. But with using or applying the annotation uh, with execution mode concurrent, we could say, dear JUnit, please use multiple uh, threads to do so. Let's run them concurrently. 
Uh, and we can apply this annotation on top of a test class or on top of the test case. But if we'll just apply it on the test class level, it will be enough to parallelize all the test cases inside. So this annotation will be somehow inherited by all the test cases within the test class, which is great because it allows us to parallelize what we want. The question is what we want to parallelize. Well, let's start from a, this classic testing pyramid. And I don't want to get into the details. What is a unit test? What is an integration test? What's the difference? It doesn't matter here. The point is that depending on what kind of testing we are doing, there will be a different performance boost that we could wait for, um, assuming that we will manage to parallelize uh, this test. And also, there will be different effort needed to turn such test case into parallelizable one. So the unit tests, so this uh, the, the bottom of the, of the pyramid should be the easiest one to parallelize because these tests should already be isolated from each other. But on the other hand, they won't give you a huge boost just because they already should be relatively fast. On the other hand, for end-to-end -end testing, for the heavy ones, if we would manage to somehow run them in parallel, then we could expect a significant performance boost. But at the same time, these tests are sharing a lot of state, doing a lot of things internally. So turning them into safely parallelizable one could be challenging. So here's my proposal, the pragmatic way of how you could parallelize your test with JN5. So let's start from parallelizing unit tests by default. Why? Because this is a low-hanging fruit of um, test parallelization. These tests should already be ready uh, to be parallelized because they are pretty isolated from each other. As for the rest, maybe it's enough to just parallelize them once it, they are ready. What does it mean? You could even take a, a scout approach, and every time you are visiting a test that is not yet parallelized, uh, you could just turn it on and see whether it works. Maybe there is just not that much of work needed to turn it into something that could be run in parallel. But the point here is, and this is a very important one, is to keep the configuration in the code. Because there is no better place of saying that this test, this particular test, should be run in par parallel than the test case itself. All right, time for the last demo uh, today. And this will be a little bit different because it starts from a configuration file. It starts from JUnit5 configuration file. Yeah, there is such a thing. You could create a JUnit platform properties file, put it in the resources uh, directory, and there configure some of the defaults of the JUnit5 behavior. Uh, we won't go through all the possible things here, uh, but only for these properties that matter in this particular context. So in line two, I'm just saying, dear JUnit, please enable the new API. At this point, it does absolutely nothing. It just enables the API. Then what I'm doing here is saying that by default, so unless specified differently, I would like to run all the test cases sequentially, just like before. All right, with such implementation or so, with such configuration in place, how the tests will look like. Let's start from the boring stuff, so from sequential tests, these that are expected to run one by one. These tests are exactly as they were before. No changes, just a add test on top of a method. That's it. Just pay attention here. As you can see, they are being run one by one. I've introduced here um, artificial delay just for the presentation purposes. Uh, all right, but this is the boring part. What about the tests that should be parallelized? There will be only one difference, annotation called parallelizable test. Let's run the test first. You will see that all these methods are now being run in parallel. But the question remains, what is this annotation? Is it part of JUnit 5? 
The answer is not. This is my own wrapper that I've created over a standard execution with execution mode concurrent. Uh, let me explain you why I think this might be a good idea. Um, the difference, or there are actually two differences here. So first, I'm limiting the scope of this annotation only to the class level. Why? Because I don't want to pollute my code with tons of annotations. It's basically, it should be enough to annotate just a test class. Then, I'm making explicit that I would like to use test instance policy or lifecycle called per method. What does it mean? JUnit 5, by default, creates a copy of a test class for every test method, just to improve isolation. And isolation is the thing if you want to make things parallel, right? So I'm explicitly opting in for this default. I'm saying, yeah, let's improve the isolation. All right, so going back to our, our test, we have a bit of test cases running in parallel and a bit of test cases uh, that should be run sequentially. So I could run them all right now using Maven. And thanks to some additional logging that I've introduced here, uh, we should see that first, we are using multiple different threads, but also what might be a little bit terrifying at first, these sequential ones are being run somewhere together with the parallelized one. Is everything OK? Yeah, luckily this, because pay attention to the threat, threat name. Sequential tests are always executed one by one on the same thread. So this is exactly what we wanted, because it doesn't care for the parallelized test uh, whether or not something else will be running um, together with them. So it's a relatively simple way of improving the uh, test execution time in your project. Back to our slides. So the nice thing about this approach, or something that I like particularly, is that it allows us to start small with an evolution instead of revolution. So we could avoid this risky big bang in our project. But of course, this leaves us with the speed versus effort trade-offs. We are the ones to decide what to parallelize, what to start from. Um, and again, there is more. If you are parallelizing tests, there are various different ways of introducing synchronization and so on. Um, so if this sounds interesting to you, and I really hope it is, you know what to do? Read the user guide. It will change everything. And that's almost all that I have prepared for today. Uh, if you want to get some more details about the things that I've just presented, on my blog, you could find two articles that go a little bit deeper into this topic. Um, and these articles, together with the other resources, like the code samples, could be found here. Uh, so we can take a picture now, later, or not at all, if you are not interested. Uh, but don't worry, at the very end of the presentation, I will leave this slide open. Um, so, and if you are interested, actually, and again, I hope you are, I have only one advice for you. Read the official user guide. It's great. Seriously. And that's it. Thank you very much. And enjoy the rest of the DevOps. <laughs>